All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. My name is Sean Honesty. I serve as our events coordinator here for our public lecture series, as well as a current master's student. So a bit of feedback there. Uh, for those of you who are new to IWP, we are a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are at all interested in learning more about us, please feel welcome to grab myself or another staff member at the conclusion of the event. Uh, again, to support the work of IWP, please visit us at iwp.edu forward slash donate. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Mr. James Rajot, Craig Weichel, and Sarah Vakshuri, who will hold a panel discussion entitled Global Energy Security, the Role of Canada. Mr. James Rajot was appointed Alberta's Senior Representative to the United States on May 1st, 2020. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Rajot served as a Vice President at Rogers Communications, where he was responsible for provincial and municipal government affairs from November 2015 to April 2020. As a member of the House of Commons for 15 years, Mr. Rajot served as the Member of Parliament for Edmonton Southwest from 2000 to 2004, and as the MP for Edmonton Leduc from 2004 to 2015. During his time in the federal parliament, he served as chair of the Standing Committee on Finance for seven years and chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Industry, Science, and Technology for two years. He also served as chair of the Canada United Kingdom Interparliamentary Association and vice chair of the Canada United States Interparliamentary Group. <laughs> okay, good. Awesome. Mr. Rajot has also served on the board of directors of the Alberta Enterprise Group the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Imagine Canada, and the Wood Buffalo Economic Development Corporation, as well as also serving in a volunteer capacity on the Board of Governors of the University of Alberta. Our second panelist, Craig Wickle, uh, has served as Counselor and Program Manager for Energy and Environment at the Embassy of Canada since August 2019. He joined the Foreign Service in 1998 and has served at the Canadian missions in Washington, Rome, Vienna, and New York. In Ottawa, he most recently served as director of the North Korea Task Force from 2018 to 2019 and Natural Disaster Response Division from 2016 to 2018. He has also had headquarters assignments in the UN Division, Nuclear Nonproliferation Division, Northern Europe Division, and U.S. General Relations Division. Last but certainly not least is Dr. Sarah Vakshuri. She is the founder and president of SV SVB Energy International a strategic energy consulting firm with offices in Washington, D.C. and Dubai. She is also an adjunct professor here at IWP, uh, teaching on energy security. Dr. Vakshuri has about two decades of experience working with the energy industry, with extensive experience in global energy market studies, energy security, and geopolitical risk. In addition to that, she has also consulted numerous public and private sector energy and policy leaders. Dr. Vekshuri has been based in Washington, D.C. since 2009, where she has advised U.S. and European governments, investment banks, financial institutions, law firms, and international corporations on energy markets, trading, pricing, trading and pricing, trading and pricing, the geopolitics of energy, and investment patterns. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Vekshuri and our panelists today.
99% of natural gas imports, 91% of electricity imports, and about 28% of uranium imports for the civilian nuclear fleet. So it just shows that, I mean, it's not just oil and gas. Oil and gas, of course, are a really huge component of that, but also when it comes to, uh, to electricity, through the uh, 35 or so transmission lines across the border, 70 plus pipelines, oil and gas pipelines, and of course uranium. Um, Canada plays a big role in, in making sure that the US uh, is energy secure. And I would say to add to that, that no one really uh, stays up at night in Washington thinking about whether Canada will cut off the supply of energy to the United States because we're a reliable, uh, trading partner. Um, we're, of course, within the, the new NAFTA, as we call it, the, the, the USMCA. Um, and uh, we always have had, you know, productive trading relationship with the U.S. We are uh, like-minded in our belief in democracy and rule of law and human rights and environmental protection. So, I mean, that relationship is, is based on, you know, over a century of cooperation between the two countries. Um, I think our biggest challenge right now, and I don't know if James wants to speak more to it, but it's, it's energy infrastructure, frankly. It's, it's a big theme. And of course, in the United States, you pretty much daily now are hearing about permitting reform and the challenges in getting uh, long-range transmission built and, uh, and, and pipelines, not just oil and gas, but also for, you know, <laughs> we hear about carbon, carbon pipelines now uh, that transport carbon dioxide underground uh, being a big deal. and. Uh, you know, hydrogen obviously is on the horizon too. Um, transmission. Transmission, yeah. But I mean, this this applies to the cross-border dimension as well, where I mentioned we have more than 70 cross-border pipelines. We have 35 major transmission lines. One of them under construction right now. One of them uh, maybe appropriately stuck in, in the main court system. So, you know, um, this is a challenge. It, 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 and frankly, it's, it's a challenge for Canada on our side too, less with I think with the uh, transmission and, and pipelines, more with mining and mine, uh, you know, for critical minerals, uh, for because of the very large environmental footprint that those have. But even with transmission, I have to say most of the the transmission goes north south and not so much east west in, in Canada. So um, that's a challenge uh, that you know we can talk a bit more about maybe in the Q and A. Maybe just a quick, a few words on. Electrification, digitization, energy transition, I mean, that's coming maybe in, in a future question too, but um, that's, that's a huge part of the relationship as well. Canada already supplies about a dozen of the critical minerals on the US list, either a uh, majority of the imports or a part of them into the US. And Canada and the US have a critical minerals joint action plan, which we announced in 2020. Uh, we've been working on very hard throughout the pandemic, and, and now I um, think you'll see when President Biden uh, visited Ottawa a few weeks ago, a uh, big part of the joint statement that he and the Prime Minister Trudeau released uh, uh, focused actually on energy transition and, and critical minerals and sort of building those, the full supply chain here in North America and with like-minded partners and diversifying our supply chains uh, so that we have you know, a reliable supply of, of, those, uh, of those materials, but also that we build the jobs uh, here in, in Canada and the US, uh, both in terms of extraction, uh, processing, but right down, right down the value chain through manufacturing. So that's a very big part of it. Um, we, uh, we have about three, Canada has about three billion dollars available to develop uh, the full critical minerals and battery supply chain. And an interesting point is under the U.S. Defense Production Act, Canada is actually considered a domestic supplier uh, because uh, of the, the close um, defense relationship that Canada and the U.S. have. So in fact, some DPA money uh, in the recent joint statement, it, it specifically said uh, 250 million dollars to U.S. and Canadian companies, and then the semiconductors part was 50 million to U.S. and Canadian companies, because for the purposes of establishing those supply chains, um, the U.S. sees it as in its, its own interest, frankly, to help develop those resources in Canada. Um, 
In the last year alone, Canada's announced more than $15 billion in the full EV supply chain, including critical minerals, batteries, and auto manufacturing. I'll leave you with a parting, just a parting thought here that in um, Bloomberg's recent um, recent rankings of uh, it does an annual battery supply chain rankings. Actually, Canada ranked second, only behind China. Uh, and in fairness, the U.S. was third. So we're both North America's doing pretty well in those rankings. And it's not an exaggeration to say that, that many countries in the world are looking to North America for, uh, for, for, for their energy security, not only now, but in the future. And with that, uh, maybe. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you so maybe much. I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> thank you. Um, very, uh, very interesting. A lot of it, you gave us a lot of things to talk and think uh, about, it, not just oil and gas, but strategic minerals, the alliance, and the interesting fact that you know, Canada is considered as kind of domestic supplier. Now, uh, moving to James, um, you mentioned that U.S. imports about 65% of uh, its imports from Canada. Uh, I'm sure my students should know by now why, because crude quality matters. United States produces a lot of crude oil, but we are still importing a lot because um, the type of crude that our refineries need in the United States are not necessarily matching the crude oil that we are producing. So I would like to uh, ask James to um, talk more about um, uh, the fossil fuels especially supplied to the United States and um, also that coming from Alberta. Yep. Happy to do so. And thank you for setting the stage, uh, Dr. Becher. And, and Craig, you did an excellent job of outlining. Can people hear the microphones here? Okay. Um, and maybe I'll just as well sort of add to the comments both of you have made in terms of overall. I would say I look at it in like two big buckets or two big challenges. And one is energy security. And within energy security, I would do reliability and affordability sort of linked in with that energy security. And then the second is addressing climate change, uh, addressing greenhouse gas emissions. And I know we're going to get to the second part later. So I'll focus some of my first remarks on the security, reliability, and affordability. And it was interesting that Dr. Venturi is sort of referencing, obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has changed the geopolitical map. But even prior to that, there were a number of incidents happened that I think within your studies uh, you should all refer to and sort of analyze. Um, you look at the Saudi Russia price war, you look at the formulation of OPEC plus, plus sort of how it came apart and then came back together. The agreement then between Russia, Saudi, and the United States in terms of trying to reduce it. And if you can recall back when I started this position, I mean, the price of oil at certain, certain points was even pegging, right? And so the impact of that in terms of the geopolitics of oil, um, if you look at the price increases that happened that after that, Obviously, what became a big issue here, especially in the United States and North America, around the world, in terms of the amount that individuals, families, businesses would have to pay for basic um, energy needs. You look at the Colonial Pipeline shutdown, if you can recall that in May of 2021, the impact that had in terms of sending a message of, okay, this is how reliant we are in terms of, not only in terms of basic energy, but in terms of energy infrastructure as well. There's a lot of people then asking, I'm going to a gas gasoline station and I can't fill up my tank, my tank here in BC because of a pipeline shutdown caused ostensibly by a hacker from another country. You look at the Texas power crisis and other crises in terms of grids, in terms of reliability. I think these are all issues linked in with reliability and security and then obviously Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I think that we have to look at that whole context and then we have to have preference for I would argue, especially since uh, the invasion of Ukraine, for where we get our products from. And we could talk about ESG and emissions, and we should talk about them more fulsome later. But in terms of a security aspect, I think that you know, the invasion of Ukraine has been a bit of a 9-11 moment for a lot of people in saying, like, we cannot simply continue to allow Russia to produce, what, 11 million barrels per day, export 7 million barrels per day, and then obviously have a lot in terms of gas provisions, and then use those funds to invade um, another country. That is just simply not acceptable, and we cannot be funding that. So we should be showing preference for allies. We should be showing preference for people who have high environmental labor standards, tribute of indigenous peoples, and all of this. And if you look at the top three oil, if you look at the top ten oil producers, 
three are democracies, the United States, Canada, and Brazil. The 11th largest producer is Norway. If you look at the environmental standards that have recently come out, uh, again, Canada is ranked number one, US and Norway number two and three. And so we have to show a preference for that from, sort of from a security point of view, but also from an ESG point of view as well. In terms of actual numbers, so Craig referenced the 62% number, and just for context, that is 10 times the amount that Saudi Arabia provides to the United States. So if you're looking at comparisons, and that is something I will tell you, when I engage with US stakeholders, members of Congress, staff, and others, and I tell them this figure, I don't think there's anyone who knows that offhand. They're, they're sort of astounded that that is actually the number that comes from Canada, comes from Alberta. In terms of actual numbers, Alberta's oil reserves, it reserves is 99% of total proven global oil reserves, fourth largest proven oil reserves in the world after Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And in 2021, our total oil reserves were about 161 barrels, billion barrels, about 99% of those reserves in the oil sands. So in terms of the number of the size of the, of the assets and that, it is there. Um, in terms of what we provide to the United States, obviously the amount, so 62%, the vast majority of that would come from the province of Alberta. In terms of natural gas, 63% of all US gas imports came from Canada. But I should also say Canada's, and Craig would have better numbers, so we are the largest, in terms of importer, US imports of most from Canada's proportion. But we also import, our biggest country that we import from is from the United States. We are very much linked. Those um, pipelines across the Canada-US border provide product both ways. And that just shows how integrated we are as a North American market. Um, now, Craig referenced on the infrastructure side, and this is the challenge for us as Canadians, is if you think about it, Canada is the only country that really faces an infrastructure test to get our product into the United States. Because if you're bringing in product by ship, you have to say the Gulf Coast or someone else, you do not face the presidential permit that we face to build a pipeline, say, across the border. And you know, we hesitate to bring it because it's a real sore point for us, but things like the Keystone XL, uh, Keystone XL pipeline, I mean, this was an issue where it crossed the Canada-US border to receive a presidential permit. It was 10% complete, and then the administration changes. And then obviously the decision was made to rip the pipeline out of the ground, and then to not move forward with that project. And that's why I think Craig referenced the big issue on permitting reform, whether it's with oil and gas pipelines or whether it's with transmission projects that come down from the province of Quebec that go into to Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts is we do need to find an area of regulatory certainty in terms of what is the process that is applied, whether it's renewable or whether it's non-renewable, and then stick to that process, frankly, through successive administrations. And that's why we're certainly hopeful as a country that there's some kind of a bipartisan agreement on that. But again, in terms of the quality of our product, we'd say it's the highest product. One of the things we do is constantly invite people up to Canada. And we invite members of Congress or staff, we have uh, Senate Energy Committee Chair Joe Manchin in Alberta last April for three days and walking him through the projects and showing exactly firsthand, okay, this is what the old sands are. And a lot of people will see, they've seen the pictures in magazines and they've opened their minds. But what we want to show you as well is the area that's been reclaimed. And there's a famous story, uh, Director James Cameron came to Alberta and so he obviously saw the open pit mines but he wanted to see him did engage with indigenous Canadians, and then he wanted to see what was done in terms of the reclamation. So they took him to a site and they said, there's three areas here. One is natural site that has never been disturbed. One is reclaimed and officially certified, and one is reclaimed not yet certified. And just take a bird's eye view yourself in terms of the quality of the reclamation going on. And then they allowed him to speak to chiefs and, and First Nations in the region, and what they said to him was, there's one company in the all sense, Suncor Energy, that does more business procurement with First Nations people in Canada than the entire government of Canada. In terms of involvement of First Nations, both in terms of monitoring from an environmental point of view, as well as in terms of participating in the projects from an economic benefit point of view, no industry has done a better job in Canada. The 
further to that, the Alberta government actually set up a billion dollar Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, one billion dollar equity fund to facilitate actually ownership and partnership in this area. So I know I go on our like yeah. probably a little more, but uh, but this is why I think you know we obviously we as Canadians as Albertans want to be seen very much as a preferred source, and whenever we meet with U.S. stakeholders, they'll always talk about Americans. Energy security, American energy independence, and we just say that's fantastic. Just add one word in front of that. It's North American for all the reasons that we don't want to do more than we want. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so it was very important and reliability and um, uh, how uh, um, reliable is Canada as a source for, um, uh, for the United States. Now I would like to move in terms of sustainability and responsible. How uh, responsible and sustainable is uh, Canadian supplies? Because uh, when we are talking about oil sands, people think uh, something very black, very dirty, very uh, harmful for the environment. Um, I had a privilege of uh, um, actually traveling to some of those reservoirs of uh, for, uh, First Nation uh, and talk to the chiefs. And uh, I asked one of the chiefs, what would be your advice for me? And he told me, connect to land. Uh, don't forget your connection to land. And land is very important for uh, people of First Nations. Um, the, it's sacred and um, they like to preserve it. Um, they do fishing, and the, the waters uh, and how fishing needs to be clean and maintained and sustained. Uh, so all of these uh, production and extraction of uh, oil or gas or all these minerals is also challenging uh, for First Nations, but also everybody else. But First Nations, obviously, for uh, reasons, different reasons, and uh, that uh, with RJ and talk, they're more sensitive to that. But um, many of the First Nations saw this as um, more uh, prosperity and helpful uh, for their people than uh, harmful uh, to their land. So I would like to, if you could uh, contribute more on uh, what you mentioned about the government and First Nations and uh, communities relation, but also on how responsible is uh, Canadian production for, uh, for the environment uh, and for the energy transition that all the countries are uh, now looking I know the pathway and then um, the um, carbon capture uh, um, um, strategies they have. So if you can just um, do that. Thank you. Um, so uh, James, if I, I mean, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of yep. an overview again, and, and maybe if you want to speak to uh, to some of the pathways and sure. uh, you know, all like Alberta's got really good stories to tell, and I, I, I can tell them too, but I'd rather let James do them because uh, um, he knows them better than I do. But, um, but just, just to give the um, sort of the, the broad strokes here. Um, so Canada has, is, is, I think we're making really good strides to, towards cleaner forms of energy. We've had, um, just so everyone knows, we've had uh, carbon pricing in place in throughout all of Canada since 2019, uh, which is uh, on an, an escalator. The price is is now, uh, I believe, it's just gone up to $65 a ton and about $15 a ton every year until 2030 when it maxes out at it tops out at 170. So um, that is applied uh, by the federal government as, as a fuel charge, um, but also, um, uh, for larger industries, uh, I mean, provinces can can uh, put in place their own carbon uh, carbon pricing. So uh, Alberta actually was was one of the I think the first in North America to have an actual carbon pricing system, followed by British Columbia. But um, but that's now uh, there's a there's a, a federal backstop in place all across Canada. So that's one part of the federal government's plan to reduce reduce emissions along with a lot of major incentives to develop cleaner forms of energy. And in fact, I encourage everyone to go into the, uh, the federal budget, which was just announced uh, uh, on March 28th, I believe, um, which uh, basically kind of 
matches the inflation, uh, doesn't match the Inflation Reduction Act dollar for dollar because that would be impossible uh, given the size of our economy. But relative to the size of the economy, I think the, the federal government has kind of sort of, you know, seen, seen the Inflation Act and, 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 and leveled up in a sense to some of the incentives for clean energy that are, uh, that are in the Inflation Reduction Act to the tune of uh, possibly about $80 billion over, over 10 years. So um, considering the Canadian economy is like around one-tenth of the U.S., that's, that's not a bad, a bad number. Um, so just going on a little bit about that, what are the types of clean energy that the Canadian government is encouraging through ta tax incentives, for instance, and through grant and, and loan programs? Um, well, clean electricity is a big part of that. The Canadian grid actually is starting out, it's, it's one of our major assets in that we, uh, the Canadian grid is about 82% non-emitting right now, but 60% of Canada's electri electricity is hydro, uh, so hydroelectricity. And some of that we, as I noted, we, uh, we export to the US, so um, some of it's from Quebec, Manitoba, British Columbia, um, all export, and Ontario actually, all export significant amounts of, of very clean electricity to the United States. And of course, it does go both ways, as, as James correctly noted. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it, and the, uh, the government has just announced a, a major new uh, clean electricity uh, tax incentive, which will help to get us from you know 82% to 90% by 2030 to hopefully 100% non-emitting by 2035, which actually matches President Biden's commitment to, to uh, a, a net zero grid, grid by 2035 as well. And again, I invite you to go to the PM, uh, to Canada-US joint statement uh, from a few weeks ago where uh, they talk about um, really deepening Canada-US cooperation and cleaning up our respective grids. Um, so uh, just in terms of, you know, we talked about coal before and that, that's kind of the, the US challenge is trying, uh, you know, it's been a lot of fuel switching in, in the recent decades since the, because of the, the shale revolution, but um, getting off of coal is actually a, a priority, I think, for, for both countries. Um, Canada uses a lot less coal than the U.S., but there are a few a few provinces, uh, including Alberta, which still use it. But Alberta is actually switching off of, uh, I think, uh, uh, switching over to natural gas uh, by the end of this year entirely, which is well ahead of schedule. So, uh, good uh, good stories there. Ontario, which is the largest uh, province in, in Canada, retired its last coal plant in 2014, and is has made a major bet on nuclear. Uh, Actually, nuclear provides about 50% of Ontario's electricity and has for many years, but um, <clears throat> Ontario Power Generation has now signed a, a memorandum of understanding effectively with the Tennessee Valley Authority to deploy small nuclear reactors, or small modular nuclear reactors, starting around 2028 in Ontario, probably the first operational SMR, grid-connected SMR in the Western world, if we want to call it that, I mean, sort of the non-Russia, non-China China world, um, should be connected to the grid and operational around 2029. 20, and I know the TVA in the US is looking at the same technology to, uh, to connect at, a, at a, an existing nuclear site in Tennessee. So that's an example, a very practical example of Canada-US cooperation there. And it's actually just been extended to, to Poland, actually, very very interested now in that, that nuclear technology. So, you know, we've said there's a way to, to net zero by using existing technology, by cleaning up our respective grids, by using technology like carbon capture, but we also have really plotted out a path where nuclear is a major part of that. It is in the US too, I and mean, it's 20% of the electricity in this country, it's about 15% in Canada. Um, so those are both, it's, it's a major source of non-emitting electricity that, you know, if we were just to shut down all the nuclear plants, well, Japan effectively faced this a few years ago after Fukushima, right? And they didn't have much choice. They had to go back, switch to either coal or, or natural gas. So um, if, if we're plotting a path to net zero by 2050, nuclear's got to be a big part of that. Um, Hydrogen also is a big part in the IRA. Certainly, the Department of Energy is uh, has made a made is making major investments in hydrogen. Canada 
announced five and a half billion over five years for the clean hydrogen investment tax credit. So again, this is an example of the federal, the Canadian federal government kind of leveling up to what was announced in the IRA for, for hydrogen. Um, carbon capture uh, has added, uh, the federal government added about $500 million over five years to the existing tax credit there. So in all of those things, you can see sort of a coordinated strategy. And I mean, you can, we, can, we can all credit the IRA, we can credit the, the, the former Congress and the current administration for the accomplishment that is the IRA and the bipartisan package that was uh, passed the, the year before that for really uh, putting the US onto a, a leadership track with respect to energy transition and also energy security because it's a big part of the IRA which is about you know, uh, oil and gas as well, frankly. But uh, I think you can see in this uh, an example of Canada really trying to um, to level up and to, to put in place really a, a bit of a coordinated North American strategy for um, for responsible, clean energy. Now, Sarah, you asked about, uh, you, you, you were, um, you, you wondered about the First Nations element and the responsible, the ESG parts, and I wanted to speak to that. Um, just because I think that's a really important part of, of our conversation today. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know reconciliation with, uh, with Canada's Indigenous people is a really uh, high priority of, of the federal government. And <clears throat> it, it natural resources is frankly an area in which you know, like other countries, frankly we uh, we haven't always had had the best track record um, in that respect, and we're trying to do better on that. Um, I think you alluded to it, Sarah, that First Nations see economic opportunities in natural resources. A lot of times, you know, their their lands are in northern areas where um, where natural resources resources are to be found. And we had a, a, a we, there's a a group called the First Nations Major Projects Coalition. It's a good example, I think, where. Uh, First Nations are taking equity stakes in natural resources projects and bringing to those projects the kind of respect for the land that you alluded to and making sure that the environmental uh, credibility of those projects is really foremost. It's a top consideration before any of those projects go ahead. On the other side, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled, and James, you will know this from, uh, from the, the, the uh, Trans Mountain Expansion Project, but really that was a, a litmus test for uh, for building new energy infrastructure. And what the Supreme Court of Canada said is, the federal government has a duty to consult with Indigenous people across whose lands these these projects uh, cross. So, um, so that now uh, is is a major. It's actually basically a constitutional requirement in Canada to to consult and, and have First Nations buy in to these kinds of projects before they go ahead. And I think that is a big part of actually solving our permitting issues because frankly, a big part of what was holding up permitting in Canada was court challenges. Probably sounds familiar to those of you here from the US, but court challenges from environmental groups and First Nations groups because they weren't necessarily always part of the process. And I think, you know, by Bringing them in, the first when the First Nations Major Projects Coalition came to Washington, it was there was a lot of interest here in town. They had no trouble getting meetings uh, within the administration and in Congress because I think it's a model that is of interest to uh, to, uh, to to Americans as well. But one thing they said is we don't mind natural resources projects. We we mind not being included in natural resources projects, and I think that's an important distinction. So um, as these go ahead, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of that, uh, both First Nations buy-in and equity in these kinds of projects, as well as making sure that the ESG credentials of those projects are top, top rate, uh, second to none. Maybe that's a good point to segue to James. But I'll pass it back to Sarah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, and one thing I, I probably neglected to mention in the outset was some of you may be wondering on a you know discussion on Canada US issues like why is a subnational government, why is Alberta here made up a lot of resources? And it's also because of the way the Canadian Constitution is written. Section 92A of our Constitution 
actually allocates uh, jurisdiction over natural resources to the provinces. Obviously, if you have infrastructure across the provincial boundaries or international boundaries, the federal government is involved. The environment is a shared responsibility, but from a natural resource perspective, that's why it's very different in the U.S., or especially in the western U.S., a lot of the states where a lot of the lands are owned by the federal government. In Canada, it's very much different. So, and I do have to always explain that with U.S. policymakers because they're wondering why a subnational government is talking to them because of the role we have there. I should have stated that at the outset. But just to continue on some of the conversation that, that Craig was pointing out, and he's correct, Alberta will be off coal this year. Alberta committed to be off coal in 2030. So we are seven years ahead of schedule. So our last plant will be shutting down, largely displaced by natural gas. But also we are having the largest, the largest renewable investments are occurring in Alberta, in part because we have our free market electric grid, which allows investment by companies like Amazon to build solar farms in Alberta. And we are building, I'm told, the three largest solar farms in Canada will be in Alberta uh, very soon. In terms of wind, uh, we are the third largest producer in terms of wind capacity behind Ontario and Quebec, but the largest per capita in that is expanding as well. And one important point to make on this is these are companies, a lot of companies who used to do coal are now doing natural gas, but they're doing increasingly wind and solar. And a company like Enbridge, which does, it's a pipeline company, but it actually has a lot of wind in the Crow's Nest Pass area of Alberta. These are energy companies that are, are doing the full gamut and when you talk about an energy transition or transformation, these companies are actually transforming as well, and in many cases leading the transformation. Um, Craig referenced the carbon price. Now, this is sort of an interactive audience. Let me ask you, when do you think Alberta put in place an industrial price on carbon? 2019? Yeah. Before. 2015. 15 before. So 12 before? 2005. A little bit behind that, 2007. <laughs> yeah. But my point is this, is that most people, A, don't think we have a price on carbon. And number two, think, if you're a major oil and gas producer, like why would you put a price on carbon way back then? I think it was a foresight of a lot of previous people in government who said, and industry who said, we need to be moving on energy transformation. So the industrial price on carbon it, it legislates it for companies in terms of the amount of emissions, and then if they go over that, they pay into a technology fund, and we call it the TIER program. And this funds organizations like Emissions Reduction Alberta, and I would encourage you to take a look at this organization. Then they partner with the industry to fund a lot of innovations in groundbreaking research on how to reduce carbon emissions on things like carbon capture, utilization, and storage, but also in new areas like hydrogen and geothermal as well. Or we believe Alberta can be a real leader. In terms of hydrogen, and I've actually brought a few of our QR codes, uh, QR cards here, in terms of our own hydrogen roadmap. The Alberta government has invested $50 million to set up a real, real center for hydrogen in the province, but also working very closely with industry. And I was in Kansas City on the weekend for kind of the final events, merger announcement of Canadian Pacific Railway, and Kansas City Southern Railway. It was a big merger. It's the first transnational, transcontinental railway, as I understand it, in the world. It's Canada, US, Mexico. It's massive for the industry, for three countries. Um, but, but CP Rail has actually developed the first hydrogen locomotive. So if you are in Calgary, make sure you go visit their facility to see. It's short haul, it's initial stages. It's not doing long haul roads yet, but it is a massive innovation it could really transform that sector in a big way. As well, there are companies both in the US and Canada, companies like Nikola, that are looking at it for long haul trucking in terms of can we use a hydrogen in our engines to actually use it for long haul trucking. They can for some short haul trucking, but we need to use it obviously for a little longer. Uh, on the geothermal side, so Governor Polis from Colorado is leading the Western Governors Association. He's the chair of this year. His entire focus is on geothermal. Uh, we just had a great conversation with his office, his regulators, his, his team there, because Alberta actually is doing a lot of geothermal, Canada is as a whole. But a lot of the oil and gas sector and the technologies and the people who work in the oil and gas sector, their skills are actually very transferable to geothermal. So we have companies like Evor out of uh, Alberta, which is a 
again, they have facilities here in the United States, but they're really doing a lot of groundbreaking things on that as well. Uh, uh, Craig mentioned small modular reactors. Alberta has no nuclear at present. We are one of four, we have one of four provinces to sign on with Ontario, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan because we believe it can be a real way for us to reduce emissions, particularly in the yellow sands in terms of generating the steam that they need. I mentioned renewables, $3 billion of investments. Um, and then uh, Craig also mentioned the pathways group. So as I referenced earlier, most of what we have in terms of our oil assets are oil sands. And the six largest producers representing 95% of that production have committed to net zero by 2050. And so they've approached both the provincial government and the federal government for assistance in doing so, particularly since the past of the Inflation Reduction Act. And they've committed to that. They're very serious about it. The CEOs have a call every week on this issue in terms of how we meet these targets. Um, they're planning a lot to do that, especially in the initial, initial stages through carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And just some numbers on that um, in terms of CCUS. So Alberta is currently home to two globally recognized commercial scale CCUS projects. Shell Quest project and the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, and they inject uh, close to 3 million tons of CO2 per year. Uh, Quest project came online in 2015, and the two facilities have combined since the <coughs> capture and store more than two million, 10 million tons of CO2. And again, the, the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line is actually the largest carbon pipeline in North America, as I understand it. But again, this is, this is technology that is very much being worked on here in the U.S. And these are areas that we're talking to US policymakers and saying, let's share best practices. Let's, let's see what you're doing in, in states like Oklahoma, which, again, are an oil and gas state, oil and gas jurisdiction. But they're, I think, beyond 40% of renewables on their grid, like percent <coughs> These are jurisdictions we really want to have conversations with to say, look, we need to have fossil fuels in the interim for reliability and all of these other issues. But we need to sort of increase for diversity reasons, for supply security also for emissions to increase the amount of renewables. And maybe I'll just, I know my time's probably limited here, but on water management as well, which we may, we may want to get into, but also in terms of the ESG side, I know it's a very hard <coughs> issue here in the United States. We have red states and blue states. We as a jurisdiction, so the government of Alberta actually established an ESG secretary. And again, when I talk to friends who may be more on the Republican side, they'll say, that's a bit odd for an oil and gas largely oil gas jurisdiction to do this. Like, why would you do this? It's because, again, going to what we've been referencing, is we are of the view you should apply high standards to uh, traditional, industry, traditional energy industries. But if you actually did so transparently, uniformly, fairly, then we believe that Canada, the United States, Norway, and these countries would rate the best. We would collaborate more to even increase in terms of better what we're doing. But then you can share those technologies. Well, this is one of the things that we did, the industry did on its own, was sign an industry partnership that they called it the CASIA Agreement, the Canadian Oil Sands uh, Institute. And if one of the companies discovered a technology to reduce emissions, they had to share it with the other ones. This wasn't about, okay, Shell does this, or you know, Suncor does this, and they hoard the technology. No, nope, now they share it with everybody, because they all have an interest in reducing emissions. And that's the kind of thing, this is partly why we set up the CSG secretary, is to tell the story, but also to say to folks, look, if we want to have a discussion about how to make things better, let's do so. And maybe the final point, because I did, I'd like to mention this. But in areas like methane emissions, which is a real issue here in the United States, globally, so Canada and Alberta signed an agreement to reduce methane emissions 45% by 2025. We are well, we are going to, easily surpass that target. In fact, I think we're renegotiating a different agreement to go way even further. But that's where industry, the regulators, two governments have really sat down, and industry and the regulator have really led in terms of reducing those emissions. So it can be done. And this is where I'd love to say, let's have a North American conversation to say, how do you measure emissions here? How can we measure emissions there? How can we work together? Why are you reducing them so much? Can these be technologies that we share across the border? Thank you. Many uh, important issues were raised, and I'm 
unfortunately we don't have enough time, I would like to talk about nuclear because uh, it's very important and as you mentioned, Craig, uh, most of the nuclear supply in terms of fuel especially is Russian supply uh, and mines are owned by China. My students are smiling. They, they had to do a lot of uh, research on that uh, during the uh, whole semester. Um, but it's very important. Uh, you mentioned Poland, uh, but uh, just a few weeks ago I had a conversation with the government of Romania. Mm -hmm. They were also, they referred to Canada and how uh, important it is uh, for them to uh, start uh, some sort of agreement or more um, uh, clear way of looking into uh, nuclear power generation from um, Canada. Um, we have gas export um, and long term when we look at uh, that uh, Canada could provide to Europe, um, but I think that nuclear would be somewhere that Canada would play a huge role in terms of global energy security and having uh, less dependency on uh, Russian uh, nuclear power generation. But um, before we open the floor uh, and plan a uh, panel for uh, Q&A, um, I would like to talk about affordability. And if I can get a very short answer from both of you, um, James, you mentioned about all the details of how Canadian producers, especially in Alberta, that they are fossil fuel producers, mostly located in this uh, region. There are a lot of uh, measures uh, that have been taken into account, even prior, uh, we went all the way back to 2007, uh, to produce a responsible and uh, clean energy, even though it's fossil fuel. But is this affordable? given the energy poverty we have in the world. And um, just if you can give me a, a brief answer in, in terms of affordability. Because in United States and Canada, we can pay premium energy, a premium prices for energy to make sure it's coming from a, a cleaner source. But uh, what uh, is this also affordable for, for the world? And um, uh, you, you talk about supplies to Europe. What, uh, what are Canadian uh, plans for uh, Africa, um, energy poverty around the world, mm -hmm. and those communities that don't have access to energy? Mm -hmm. I'll do affordability, yeah. and then you can yeah. talk about the uranium and Saskatchewan. Energy, energy yeah. 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 Um, So in terms of energy affordability, and I should have mentioned this, so again, if you look at most of our, our oils and oil sands, and also I should have mentioned this as well, so some of it, 20% of it is in what you call mine. So it's closer to the river and it's mine. You see those open dead mines. 80% of it is done through in situ. So it's actually done through, they do directional drilling and then they pipe the steam down, they separate the oil from the sand underground and then they bring up bitumen that way. So it's far less uh, sort of displacing far less earth. Obviously, if you go to the, actually the site and it's interesting, we walk out our mansion around the Sonoma site there sort of like, well, is this it? Is this all you're going to show me? It's just a few pipes and above ground, and then we took them through the facility itself. So it's a different type of process. Now, it, there is a perception when you talk to folks <coughs> in the financial sector in New York, they'll say, well, Canadian energy is very expensive. You know, it's very expensive to produce, which is actually not true. It's the opposite. It is very expensive to build the facilities, so to actually set up the, whether it's a mine or whether it's the since you said it's expensive to put everything in, so there's a lot of upfront capital costs. But once the facility is actually operating, it is actually quite inexpensive to operate on an ongoing basis. And I would say further to this, um, now we don't like this, but you would like it as our customers, is we face a discount. So if you look at the price of oil, uh, the Brent price is the highest, obviously. Then you have West Texas Intermediate. And between West Texas Intermediate and the West Canadian Centimetry is about Right now it's about fifteen dollars, which is not bad. It's it's been up to twenty-five dollars plus actually. So we actually face a discount in part because we have trouble accessing markets, whether it's pipeline capacity or other issues. It is a heavier crude though, which is a different type of crude, but to your point it's actually we would say it's a higher quality crude, which a lot of the refiners in the US like because they get all sorts of products out of that type of crude. So in terms of affordability, and again in terms of transportation down right in the North American continent, if you're moving this by pipeline, it is actually very inexpensive to get. So it does address that huge issue in terms of energy. Thank you. Let's see if this microphone works. Yeah. 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 Ye
see if it works. Yeah. That's the real Okay, maybe that's it. Interference uh, has been eliminated. Um, yeah, I think I think in terms, you know, so I, I'll just piggyback on what James just said about a about lack of infrastructure, right? Because that has been our, our challenge in the most recent crisis with Europe, for instance, when last year they, you know, uh, basically they progressively got cut off from Russian uh, natural gas, and of course, put in place sanctions so that they weren't going to buy it anymore. Um, Canada does not yet have an operational LNG facility, and but the good news is one is under construction, a very uh, big one, LNG Canada on the coast of British Columbia, which uh, and the pipeline, which I believe I, I, I have to check this out, but the Coastal Gas Lake I believe has Indigenous equity in it now as well, but. Uh, that will effectively be the world's cleanest LNG liquefaction uh, facility because it's using it's using uh, hydroelectric uh, power, right? These facilities use an incredible amount of power, and they and can emit anywhere from three to five megatons per per annum of uh, of greenhouse gas, a carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, in this case, this is pretty close to zero. So um, there, that's a large facility that should be going into operation in 2025. There's a, that will be doubled by about 2030 with the, the phase two of that. And there's a couple of smaller ones on the West Coast that are also um, effectively, I think, permanent, but um, still sort of final investment decisions to be taken. East Coast is more problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, anything, I think there's one active facility in uh, Nova Scotia that's uh, being looked at and one in Newfoundland and Labrador, but uh, requires significant infrastructure upgrades. Pipeline or gas lines effectively being the, the major issue going through uh, different jurisdictions. So um, one thing I will say though is that when the call came for the US to, uh, to increase its LNG production and exports to Europe. And the US was doing really solid diplomatic work to redirect shipments and, and make sure that Europe, uh, the light stayed on through through the winter, through this past winter too. Um, Canada actually increased, they made a commitment to increase its, its oil and gas production by 300,000 barrels a day equivalent. That included oil and gas equivalent. And we did that, and I think we managed it. You know, it may not sound like a lot, but I think it was about five to seven percent that was increased, and that helped take the pressure off the U.S. Right, because as the U.S. was sending more LNG out, that was more gas and oil into the U.S. to help ease the pricing situation here. So it just goes back to you know when we talk about affordability that. That's inc that increase in supply helped U.S. affordability, and that also helped. Uh, Europe and, and allies uh, abroad to be able to to afford to um, you know to, to keep the lights on. I, I would say too, like looking out a little further, uh, the G7 energy ministers just uh, met in Japan, and there's been I understand there's a 36 page uh, uh, communique from that, so I haven't got around to <laughs> parsing the 36 pages yet, but I'm sure that I know there's it's because there's a lot in there, right? And um, you know some of that will be on gas, uh, but also on you know nuclear uh, and uh, hydrogen as well, and that's where Canada has been working with with those partners um, to sign agreements for green hydrogen. I know that when Chancellor Schultz came uh, from Germany came last year to Canada, there was an agreement, and then uh, the Japanese Prime Minister came as well uh, this past winter. There were agreements on on green hydrogen. Um, we also have uh, effectively joint action plans now with the European Union on critical minerals, with Japan, and with the United Kingdom. So all of those things, those kind of followed in the footsteps of the Canada-US joint action plan. So we're really trying to work closely with, with all of our like-minded partners to, to shore up those uh, energy supply chains. And when we think of energy, uh, I think you know we need to 
keep in mind that the future increasingly is going to rely on batteries and electrification, and that's going to be really a, a strategic uh, part of our our energy mix in the future. It already is, but it's going to be even more important. So uh, those kinds of agreements, you know, Canada is, is really trying to to, uh, to make sure, and, and also to get the investment in to develop those resources. Um, do you mean we'll just leave it at that? led by France, um, but with going back to the controversial sale of majority stock in Uranium One from Rosatom, or to Rosatom, and them also having a huge footprint in the US, you talked about a wake-up call in terms of natural gas um, and how that has changed strategic thinking. Has that also been a factor with Uranium in Canada? I would say an emphatic yes to that, and and I think for, with the U.S. as well, frankly, um, we uh, so I, I talked about small modular reactors. Um, they are going. To, they they their fuel is low enriched uranium or even high assay low enriched uranium, which is is, is simply um, higher um, uh, U two three five uh, up to just just shy of twenty percent. For, for a smaller, more compact design, so you need a, a slightly uh, higher enrichment level. Um, and a whole bunch of utilities and companies woke up on February, well, I don't know, they, they probably realized it on February 24th, but let's say February 25th last year that their short-term fueling plans for all of those were out the window, right, because they largely relied on contracts with, uh, with 10X, which is the, the Russian state-owned uh, enrichment, uranium <laughs> enrichment supplier. Um, so that, that was a big wake-up call for the nuclear industry, and I was a uranium industry included in that. Um, because, I mean, the Russians, to be the way this developed was, was back in the day, me megatons to megawatts and downblending ex-Soviet nuclear weapons into nuclear fuel, and the Russians were, became very good at, 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 you know, at providing that service at low cost to many other world's countries, including the United States, which, where uh, you know, there's the Russia Suspension Agreement, which allows up to about 20% of the, the US uh, low enriched uranium to be provided by Russia. Canada's in a bit of a unique situation because our reactors don't, they rely on natural uranium, not on enrichment, because it's a function of our history, but Canada realized uh, very early on we have lots of natural uranium, um, and we're not planning on developing nuclear weapons, so uh, we don't need enrichment, so we will just develop the CAMU reactors, which are to this day, uh, produce you know as I said, 15% of our electricity through natural uranium fuel. But the next generation of small modular reactor of reactors are going to rely on LEU and HALU. So, uh, so if we're going to deploy those and be a part of that you know supply chain in Canada and actually build and be part of that technology. Um, we need to have access to that fuel. So, in sum, I mean, again, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I, I, I do refer you to the Canada-U.S. joint statement where, uh, I mean, it's very upfront in that between the Prime Minister and the President to have realized that Canada and the U.S. need to work closely together, not exclusively, but also with other partners. You mentioned France, the U.K., Japan, which are, you know, major G7 uh, countries that operate uh, reactors um, 
we need to work with, with those in other like-minded countries to ensure that we have reliable supply of the fuel that we will need in the future. And Canada has, you know, the, the, the world's highest grades of, of uranium in the province of Saskatchewan, which is next door to Alberta. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we really, um, we, as I said earlier, we supply about 28% of the, the U.S. supply of uranium. Um, but, you know, we can do more. And that's not just uranium sort of from the mine. That's extracted, it's milled, it's refined, and then converted into uh, uranium hexafluoride, UX, UF6, in, in Canada. The only part of the fuel cycle that we don't do is enrichment. And the U.S. does do enrichment, but it doesn't have a lot of uranium. So it has some. It has some. It has its strategic side, a strategic stockpile, and then it has some for, for but, but economically speaking, it kind of is, kind of, it's kind of a match made in heaven, really, to say between Canada and the U.S., let's, let's uh, pool our resources here and make sure that we each have enough of the fuel that we need and our partners and allies abroad, and we can lead on providing the next generation of, of nuclear technology, which will help us reach our net zero goals and actually produce a lot less waste uh, for future generations to deal with. Yes. Uh, my name is Paul, and uh, I'm from the North Korea Freedom Commission, some of the alliance of this Institute of World Policy. So I have one question. Does the Canada also apply the rule of the human rights to make a decision to continue international trade? For example, the, when there was the Korean-Canadian policy was detained in North Korea, I heard the Canadian world government, I feel very thankful that Canadian world government cut the international trade to export the uh, course to North Korea. But when I heard that uh, Canada is uh, trading with the China, I wonder that the same rule of human rights is applied to influence on continue on to make to determine the consistency of inter international trade. I guess this one's for me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, it, it's a very, it's a, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. It's also a very tough question. Um, so I'll do the best that I can, not being a, an expert in international trade, but just full disclosure. I mean, I do have some experience uh, in, in working in Ottawa, as you heard, with our, our North Korea task force. I mean, Canada has a sanctions regime, a domestic sanctions regime, uh, which is, is a little different than the US one, but in principle, it's designed to do the same thing, which is to persuade through, you know, uh, through sanctions uh, to, for, for countries which are, um, you know, bad actors to make better policy choices, right, and in, in, including in, in human rights terms, right? So it is, a, it is a priority for the Canadian government, and we have those sanctions in place for a number of countries that we feel are, are violating uh, international norms, whether it be on uh, weapons of mass destruction or human rights. Um, you mentioned China. I mean, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a tough one. I mean, we've had uh, governments have 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 stressed uh, human rights in their dealings with China. It's not it's not subject to sanctions. Um, it's not in the U.S. either. But I mean, there are ongoing discussions. I mean, we try to use trade as I would say as a positive leverage or or inducement to you know convince the Chinese government to do a better job with. Uh, with, uh, with its human rights record. I think there's also, you know, we talk, it makes me think of, of Xinjiang, right, where there is a major human rights issue in China. And I believe, and again, I would have to check this out, but I know that in terms of products coming out of that area, there, uh, there, there have been sanctions imposed or at least, you know, considered on, on products coming from those areas, right, including here in the US. So I'm sorry I can't do better with that question. Um, but I hope it, it shows that you know, like the U.S., like our, our you know our, our European partners, we are you know um, very conscious of of that, and we always 
raise uh, human rights in any of our bilateral dealings with those governments. Thank you, Rob. And I can make two brief comments. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Um, just, I would make two brief comments. Is one is obviously that we would say show preference for countries where you're getting products from. And it relates to the earlier question as well. So we would say this for energy, is obviously then make Canada your prefer preferable source for energy. And don't put you know obstacles against getting Canadian energy and showing preference. I mean, we were, as a province, I mean, as a country, we were quite upset when the administration went to other areas of Venezuela and Iran, when there have been obstacles placed in terms of Canadian energy. So that's one. I think secondly, though, and the question on China, it's, it's very challenging because of China's dominant size in terms of the global economy. But it is something, again, related to your earlier question, the argument on natural gas, the argument on nuclear applies to critical minerals. And so today, we couldn't simply say, OK, we're going to not engage with China and trade on critical minerals because about 80% of the market. But it shows why Canada and the US have placed such importance on this, is to say that's not an acceptable, frankly, short, medium, long-term situation. And we need to then address that, which I think both countries and subnational governments have Alberta, Saskatchewan, and others are very much trying to do by saying, let's have more of the mining, the process, and refining everything back in the North American context. Well said. Thank you. Uh, my name is Harul. I'm Dr. Washuri student. Uh, thank you, great, James. You actually answered many of my questions I had. But on the uranium production, uh, based on information, uh, U.S. is still buying Russian uranium. Mm -hmm. Can Canada or Canadian uranium replace the Russian? Um, I would say the answer to that is probably yes, in terms of the you know the the uranium coming out of the ground until it is converted into UF6, but we would not be able to, at this point in time anyway, we would not be able to provide the enrichment services that the Russians do uh, for their contracts with US utilities. So that's really, like, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated question because there's multiple points in the fuel supply chain where the Russians, I mean, they, they don't mine it all there either. I mean, it is yeah, also the that uranium that. that they are enriching is coming from places like Kazakhstan yeah. and, and other yeah, and other countries, uh, as well as from Russia. And then they are, you know, they're adding value to it, right, before it gets put on a ship and, and sent to the US. Um, the US. I know the US utilities are very conscious of this and, and they are, you know, there is there's an effort underway to just again to diversify sources. But we're where this Canada-US dimension comes in, I think, is, is, is really, um, yeah, ex it's like you said, can Canadian suppliers take the place of, of Russian ones for the, the resource and for various points in the supply chain? Yes. I think the answer is yes. We've been told as much by Canadian suppliers. Although, even when it comes to conversion, the facility in Port Hope, Ontario, the Cameco facility, is basically at capacity, or, or very close to it. They've ramped up. So to build additional capacity, you know, you, you, you will probably take a few years. That's also true with enrichment in the United States, uh, which is provided by Uranco, among others. That's a, a, a European consortium which has a plant in the United States. And they've said, well, that's fine. Show us demand for our product. As a stakeholder, Russia is actually a stakeholder. Well, it, it, in, in, in a sense, but I mean, Urenko has said, you know, if we're going to make a, an investment of hundreds of millions of dollars in new capacity, we've got to have, we've got, you've got to show us the contracts, you know, these re reactors are going to go online and they're going to need the fuel. So there's a little bit of a, a catch-22 going on there between the, the, the operators and the, the fuel providers, but I think we're going to get it all figured out. I mean, it's, we've already made a lot of progress in the last year. And it's just, you know, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time, though, to, 
to, it, it's the same with the critical minerals. I mean, uh, James referred to, you know, 80% of, of processing, probably more than that for rare earth elements. That's going to take time. You can't, the Chinese developed this capacity over 30 or 40 years. Same, and hopefully it doesn't take us 30 or 40 years to do, to get the uranium one figured out. Hi there, my name is John Mueller. I'm also uh, one of Dr. Mushroom's students. I just want to start off saying thank you very much for coming out today. Uh, my question pertains to Canada's uh, uranium deposits as well as oil and natural gas. So obviously countries such as Russia and China hold considerable stakes in mines and companies that operate these resources. Is there a plan uh, or even a discussion within the Canadian government to potentially dissuade future investments such as these? or a potential plan to buy back some of these shares uh, in terms of shoring up domestic energy security for Canada? I didn't ask you to ask only uranium. No, it's question. okay, but it's, it, seems, it seems to be uh, of interest. And there, 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 there is an oil and gas component to that question sure. as well. Um, yes, uh, I, I mean, again, I, I would point, first of all, I'm not aware of any uranium deposits, any, any uh, Canadian uranium, which is owned by those interests, of, you know, state-owned or enterprises from those countries or anything like that. Uranium is 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 one of the exceptions to what uh, James referred to earlier about the Constitution, where uh, uranium is actually federally regulated, not necessarily owned, but but regulated by the federal government for, I mean for obvious reasons, I guess, for, for mm -hmm. dating back to the Second World War. Um, so in terms of critical minerals, it's been a really, and mining, it's been a very big uh, subject of discussion in Canada. The Minister of uh, Science, well, his title, basically the Industry Minister, but Innovation, Science, and Technology, Minister uh, Champagne, uh, released a policy statement, I think it was last November, uh, which was a policy clarification under the Investment Canada Act, which is like CFIUS, it op operates here for review of foreign investment in, in the US. Investment Canada Act is the sort of parallel mechanism in Canada, which effectively ordered three uh, Chinese uh, interests or enterprises to divest themselves immediately of their Canadian holdings and basically said that any state-owned enterprise, which is, uh, you know, which makes a bid for Canadian critical minerals resources will, I mean, would only be approved in exceptional circumstances. Um, and there's now legislation going through Parliament, which I think will make amendments, appropriate amendments to the Investment Canada Act. So uh, I think in that sense, Canada may, I mean, I know our, you know, I think the U.S. government took note of that, and, and I think the, in terms of the clarity of the statement, I think we, we may actually have, have been a little bit ahead of the curve on that one. So, um, oil and gas, I mean, that's been a, that's a, and in the oil sands, there's been investment in, in those uh, deposits as well over time, but they have, that's evolved in the last 10 years as well. I mean, do you want to yeah, speak to that? There's actually been quite a, consolidation on the Canadian side. So right, right now when I talk about the Pathways Alliance, the six largest producers, 95% of the production. So they would be North American companies. So CNRLs and all this, Suncor, they're all actually headquartered in Calgary, Alberta. And then we have Imperial, so obviously a North American company, Conical Phillips. Uh, there was some investment from Saudi Arabia years ago. And I think it's actually been pulled back. I don't know to what extent. Saudi Arabia is still invested in oil sands. Um, and then a lot of the other countries pulled out, and that's when a lot of the consolidation occurred. So I don't see it, it is not seen as much of an issue, and I'm happy to sort of follow up on that for you, but it's not seen as much of an issue of the oil gas Thank you very much. Sean, there's a gentleman here. Yeah, they have there. Oh, sure. Yeah, don't worry, I'll get you guys more. <laughs> it's great to see all the questions. Yeah, I have to say, I'm really happy. <laughs> Just American security in general. When I say American, I mean the Americas as a whole. It's a, it's a 
good question. Um, I think I know. I mean, we. I mean, both Canada and the U.S. engage with our, you know, Central and South American. I mean, Mexico, obviously, in the first in instance, right, which is is sort of for the purposes of trade, is North America, uh, and then Central America and South America. It's it's been a recurring theme, and I know uh, in my time here, I've been in Washington about three and a half years uh, working on this, and you know, it's it's definitely been a, a preoccupation for successive administrations in the U.S. in terms of uh, the the Americas and and how you know we supply energy to each other. Um, Canada. And for the reasons I, I described, we're probably, because the U.S. is directly south of us, sort of stands in the way of the rest of the Americas from our vantage point and takes up so many of our exports, I think it's been probably a little bit less of a, a practical consideration than it has been for, for the U.S., which has, you know, for any number of reasons, um, is, it's probably top of mind. Um, but that said, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of room for Canada and the U.S. to engage with those countries, and and, and, and we're doing that. I mean, you just think, you know, Brazil is, as being an obvious example of a country, an enormous country with uh, in order, large resources, but also a country we need to convince to do, you know, to, to preserve more rainforest in order to to save all of us, right? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of avenues for discussion there. I'm not sure, James, about the, the flows. I mean, obviously, you know, Mexico and Venezuela are two, or at least were, but uh, again, are, are major oil producers and provide the similar heavy oil that, or the heavy crude that, that Alberta does. And that's always been a consideration for U.S. Um, energy security there, because of course the the refineries on the Gulf Coast are are particularly designed to accept that kind of crude, and and so I mean this is where the U.S. is looking at it a little bit you know differently than Canada is. I don't know, James, if you want to add to that. Well, maybe just two points is. So it wasn't that easy a question. <laughs> no, and it's a big one, very yeah. big one. But in terms of critical minerals, I think obviously both Canada and the U.S. would like to see. Uh, Central and South America becomes sort of a partner in a broader way on that issue. In, in terms of oil and gas, though, I mean, this is where Venezuela is the big elephant in the room because of policies of its regime and government. And, and so, I mean, they have, you know, they're one of the top three um, in terms of reserves in the world. And so they could be certainly an energy powerhouse. But obviously, it's a big political issue here in the United States. And it's a, it's a political issue in Canada as well in terms of some of the actions of the regime. So that's where you know we'd love to see the country doing better from an energy point of view. But again, it's where, uh, frankly, we point out and say, if you're choosing preference in terms of energy source, obviously you'd say, you'd say Canada over Venezuela. If I, if I could just add a footnote, and, and James makes the excellent point on the, on the critical mineral side yeah. of it, which is you know countries like Chile and Argentina massive uh, deposits of, 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 of lithium there and other critical minerals. Mexico actually, Colombia, they, they all, there's, there's a lot there. And I think we all see that as part of, you know, we're probably, Canada can supply a lot of this stuff, we can't supply all of it, and we recognize that to diversify the supply chains, it needs to also be from countries like that, that have, you know, responsible uh, uh, mining practices and you know Canadian companies actually have a significant amount of investment in those countries uh, in, in terms of mining and that's been a big focus for us is, is in terms of responsible sustainable mining so that we're not sort of replacing one problem with a new problem in our hemisphere. However, I just want to add one point is that um, one thing is the reserves and the other point is the process and we're talking yeah. about the yeah. strategy. So uh, we have um, in the continent a lot of strategic minerals, but you mentioned Chile, uh, they're all processed by China. So I think on the processing side, we're still behind China. We are. Yeah.
Bob Hershey, I'm an energy consultant. Could you tell us a bit more about what you're doing with hydrogen? Well, I, I can start. Thanks for your question, Bob. Um, I mentioned off the top that the government has announced a very significant investment in the form of an investment tax credit in hydrogen. So I think it's I say five and a half billion over five years. So that's over a billion a year, which obviously proportionately I think matches up fairly well to what uh, the U.S. is offering through the Department of Energy. Um, I mean, a lot of our hydrogen-related activity is taking place in Alberta, conveniently. Um, James mentioned the the CP locomotive. I, I know that there's also uh, a lot a lot of work going on with uh, running you know, tractor trailers with hydrogen uh, under extreme cold conditions because that's one of the, you know, testing it in, in, in the middle of an Alberta winter will pretty much guarantee you can run it almost anywhere. Um, so, uh, you know, no kidding, minus 40 will probably uh, go a long way. So, I mean, that, those, that, that's working it's for 40 Fahrenheit and Celsius. Yeah, they, 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 yeah. minus 40 if Fahrenheit and Celsius are the same, so it's, uh, there's no conversion. Um, but uh, I know, like, the, hydrogen is a challenging one, of course, because it's doesn't necessarily, it's not the easiest to transport over long distances, um, and that's why we, we talk a lot about hydrogen hubs. I think there's probably a lot of potential for them in the Alberta oil sands, also in uh, heavy industry in, in Ontario and Quebec, you know, steel making. We're looking at it very seriously now for, uh, for, for, for steel, concrete, these hard to abate industries where they're, they're currently very carbon intensive. Um, and you know, I, I think there's, there's, with the investments that we're making, I think there's probably you know, um, a lot of opportunities there for the private sector to develop whether in Canada, in the US, but also for, for there to be cross-border collaboration on that. We've talked about pipelines too, and you know, we talk about mixing hydrogen into gas pipelines. There's an ongoing discussion over that, about you know, whether the, the appliances can even take the heat that it, because hydrogen burns at a higher temperature. Um, but uh, James, I don't know if you have anything on that. Maybe just add some facts for you. So Canada ranks uh, in the top 10 in terms of hydrogen production. Alberta is first in terms of hydrogen production. So 2021, we produced approximately 2.5 million tons. Um, now about 55% hydrogen production is used for heavy oil upgrading, about 40% for the chemical sector, the synthesis of ammonia, and 7% for oil refining. So a lot of it is in the oil and gas sector, but that's where a lot of our expertise is. Our capacity for clean hydrogen production could be 45 million tons per year. And modeling shows that our province can reduce GHG emissions by 14 million tons per year, with the majority resulting from industrial emissions uh, savings. But there's approximately about $12 billion Canadians worth of hydrogen-related projects currently underway. Obviously, this is where there's a whole discussion, again, applying colors to hydrogen, green, blue. Most of it would be considered blue hydrogen, but we're looking more at how can we capture the carbon in the process to have it considered a greener form of hydrogen. There's actually, a, again, a center of hydrogen excellence in the province. I have a card just on hydrogen, which I'm happy to share with you. And then there's a convention, um, there's a center of excellence, but there's a convention every spring in Edmonton, which we're happy to invite you to participate. I don't know if there's virtual participation, but it is very much a focus of the provincial government and the federal government as well. If I could, James keeps triggering my, my memory for, uh, for additional points, but I just wanted to refer you as well to, to Canada's hydrogen strategy, which is available online. You just put Canada hydrogen strategy, you'll see it on the Natural Resources Canada website. But it is, forget the exact numbers, but I think they're broadly, you know, probably multiply what James said about uh, the economic opportunity there and the potential emissions reductions and, and sort of multiply it by about maybe three times and that's about where the where, where we end up but um, but the way to produce hydrogen will vary across Canada so in 
in Alberta, it might be more contingent on uh, carbon capture, for instance, you know, natural gas uh, production with carbon capture or wind or solar. Uh, whereas in, in Eastern Canada, it might be, there might be more reliance on, uh, for instance, on hydro or nuclear. So, and, and actually in Newfoundland, they're talking, uh, they're trying to build offshore wind to produce green hydrogen too. So there's a lot out there. It's just, it needs more investment to move, to move forward. We have time for one more question. Well, I mean, uh, Clintus, I'm sure will like to okay. take questions after the formal sure. that as well. Just well, we could take two at once. Okay. okay. Yes, let's take two. Uh, hi, I'm Kate. I'm a Canadian. I was born and raised in Vancouver, and I actually spent my summers in Port Hope, so I'm very familiar. Do you know where Port Hope is? <laughs> yeah. Very nice town. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question focuses on the proposed just transition legislation that's been put out. I've heard kind of two criticisms from you know, Daniel Smith, Peter Polyev, my uncle Dale, um, and they basically center around job loss for oil and gas workers as we transition away from uh, those forms of energy, and then also concerns that if Canada moves away from producing oil and natural gas, we'll be dooming Europe and our other allies to be dependent on you know, Russia and other less friendly countries. Um, and so I'm just curious how you would respond to those concerns and what's in place to kind of mitigate those concerns within uh, the just changes. Let's take the second question. Um, my name's Ariana. I'm another student of Dr. Vashkuri. Um, I just have kind of a little bit of a different question. Um, you talk about all these investments and funds that Canada has in uh, Alberta specifically, but what would be some of your recommendations for high poverty countries as such in Africa that may not have the infrastructure nor the funds, nor the water access um, that Canada might have, and their decentralized um, country. So what would be some of the recommendations that you would tell African countries, or if Canada has any other projects in Africa? Yeah. Um, uh, maybe, do you, do you want me? Go first. If you want to do both, then I'll okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, so we'll talk a bit about just transition first. Um, so yeah, you, you're you're right that it's the term has become a little bit of a political football in in Canada recently. Um, I, I mean, I think I think it's so there there is legislation that a federal legislation that is pending and is not not gone through Parliament yet on ensuring that the transition or transformation, whatever word we, we choose, is uh, is fair and just to communities that are, you know, uh, dependent in, in the current time on conventional sources of energy. And, and it's, it's not different, it's not substantially different than the situation here in the U.S., except I think it's probably, there's, there's more, it has more to do with coal communities here in the U.S., frankly, in, in certain uh, states than in Canada, where it, it, we're primarily talking about oil and gas. Um, <clears throat> I don't think, you know, throughout all of this, there, the projections have always shown that while oil and gas consumption will go down and, and, and need to go down, that, you know, we've always said the, the, that the world is going to continue to need oil and gas in certain forms uh, right through the transition. And as our Minister of Natural Resources once said, it's not the fuel, it's the pollution. So there are, there are a lot of things you can make out of oil and gas, including, you know, most of our devices and things that we use every day and hardly think about uh, through petrochemicals, but also there, there's cleaner ways to produce them. And a lot of what James was talking about, um, really there's a lot of low hanging fruit there, whether it's methane, 
uh, or um, you know burning uh, gas to get the stuff out of the ground, whatever. There's there's near term current technology we can employ now to to get our emissions down and get us you know keep us on on track for 2030 and 2050. Um, so in terms of jobs, I think the federal government is is sees a huge much like much like President Biden. I mean, when he when he first came in, he said when he thinks of climate change, he thinks of jobs, right? It's not that different. That there is an enormous opportunity here for, including for areas uh, like like Alberta, provinces like Alberta that currently uh, produce a lot of oil and gas. But I you know I think about an Alberta company uh, that is working on very cutting edge technology to extract lithium from uh, brine that is left in de depleted oil fields in the southern part of the province. And you know, it, so there, there, there's a lot of opportunities coming there. I think about hydrogen too. So I think when we talk about just transition, we're talking, uh, they, they're, they're, I mean, even, even for oil and gas workers, there's, um, there's, there's opportunities in you know, offshore wind, for instance. Now, that's not to say that every single worker is going to currently works on oil and gas is going to go off and work on offshore wind. But the economy is changing. It's not going to happen overnight. We also know that. We've talked about that today, how you know, oil and gas jobs are not going to disappear anytime soon. And so I think we're trying to talk about the energy transition in a way that also says that this is not going to be a net, uh, 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 we'll say like a, a net, a net negative for for jobs in different parts of the country, and, and I think you know I think Senator Manchin probably I don't want to speak for him, but I, based on his statements, I think he sees opportunities for hydrogen and common uh, uh, carbon capture in West Virginia as well to take the place of some of the coal jobs that have been lost. Um, poverty, Africa. Um, really important question because all of these uh, developing countries are, they're developing, right? And they are increasingly needing more electric, needing to, they're electrifying, bringing electricity to people who haven't had it before. Um, they are uh, using more energy than they did. I mean, a big part of it, I think, is, and in Canada actually, we just, signed on in the, when the president was in, in Ottawa. Um, a lot of things happened during the visit, but one of them was Canada agreed that it would join the, uh, the US uh, initiative for helping developing countries develop their uh, capacity for nuclear energy. Um, it's called the FIRST program, and that is specifically targeted at Africa. So that would, that, that's something that we're gonna be working on. But I, I think, you know, these countries actually have tremendous resources in solar, wind, all of these things which have come down amazingly in, in price in recent times. And I think, you know, if we help them to develop the resources in those areas, as well as, you know, batteries, um, that's going to go a long way towards satisfying the increase in energy demand without adding a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere, which is kind of the other side of it, right? We need to help them do that without um, sort of put, pushing us uh, past the tipping point in terms of carbon. So that's fairly general. I have James to turn up. Yeah, I think it, in some ways the questions are actually related, so let me just make a few points that it is. I'm mindful I'm no longer in my political life, I'm a diplomat, so I will be as diplomatic as I can be, but there is, I'd say there is a different view, which you highlighted you know, in the political sense, north of the border. Um, and there is concern about job loss, job loss from the Alberta government. I think, as Craig points out, there is jobs certainly in carbon capture, utilization, of storage, potential in geothermal, potential, I'd say, in geothermal and hydrogen. But if you're looking at renewables, I mean, once you build a solar farm, once you do a wind farm, there's just simply not the number of people required as there are in, say, an oil and gas facility to operate either a mine or in situ site. And so that there is some real concern that the Premier and others are reflecting in terms of that issue. But I, I think they would also say that don't sort of kill the golden goose. I mean, 60% of the funding for clean tech, according to the federal energy minister, comes from the oil and gas sector. So encourage the oil and gas sector to keep doing that, to keep driving the transformation. 
But if you sort of take funds away or you cause that sector to be less productive, less profitable, you are then affecting the money that goes to the clean tech sector. I would say as well, energy companies, again, is Enbridge a pipeline company? It's an energy company, so it has an awful lot of wind. Capital Power, yeah, did they used to have coal? They did, now they're off coal. Now they have a lot of wind and solar. They have natural gas, but they are energy companies, and so there are companies that will, again, make the transformation, have more renewable or whatever as part of the overall, but you have to enable them, to, again, to be profitable, especially at the beginning, to invest in renewables that may be more costly you know, the initial term. I would say as well, um, you know, 100 million barrels per day is essentially what the world uses roughly, and it's gonna use a lot of million barrels per day for the foreseeable future. We would argue decades. And we argue that there should be a, you know, you should have preferences in terms of where the source comes from, and you should apply the highest standards. Again, apply, apply the highest ESG standards, we believe Canada and Alberta meet those high standards, as does the U.S. and Norway and others, and that should be a preferable source. And the invasion of, of uh, Ukraine, in our view, drove that point home very, uh, very strongly. In terms of the question on high poverty, so a lot of Albertans actually work all over the world. They work in Africa, and they apply their technical expertise there. And so they would come home and say, yes, we cannot simply say Africans, like you have to then reduce emissions by the same equivalent as say Canada and US does, that's simply not fair. They deserve to improve their quality of life and they deserve to certainly improve for their, their families and their, their communities. Our responsibility as I see it then is to do these funds, do these carbon prices, develop the technologies and then share the technologies and the best practices that we develop. Frankly, as the industry has done, as I mentioned before, one company comes across a technology that lowers emissions that should be shared across the industry. Frankly, it should be shared across the globe so that it makes you know, the best practices are applied. But to your point, it has been an issue in the past where because we're publicly traded companies in Canada, like there was one example, Talisman, a company out of Calgary was heavily invested in Africa. And some activists went to their shareholder meeting and strongly encouraged them in very vocal ways to invest of those assets, so they did. And they sold those, as those assets to a Chinese state-owned enterprise. And that's where I think we need to think very strategically and say, you know, maybe it's not the best situation, but it's, it's far better to have a Canadian company, which is, again, has to answer to their shareholders like this, in charge of those assets, rather than a Chinese state-owned enterprise, which obviously does not have the same type of accountability. So, I know there's an awful lot there, but that's, the questions are actually quite linked, but we, we would argue very strongly, we are the preferable source. Let's continue to apply those high standards. Challenge us even more, make them higher, come to Alberta, come to Canada, visit the you know facilities and challenge us, but then ensure that those standards are applied right across the board. Sorry. I, no, I, I mean, I'm doing it again, but I, I just, it, you keep jogging my, my, my thinking on this, but I, one other way to think about this in terms of developing countries is in terms of climate finance, right? And how I know developed countries have not quite met their uh, commitments yet that they made, but they are getting there. And some of the uh, agreements that have been put, put in place, I mean, uh, Secretary Kerry has been sort of at the forefront of, of, of some of those uh, to try to, um, and Canada's joined in on those as well, like with, uh, with uh, South Africa, of Indonesia, not in Africa, but it's, you know, to, with with countries that are big countries that are starting to use significantly more energy, and their you know their their middle classes are developing, but they're also kind of stuck when it comes to energy, and, and South Africa is, is coal largely, um, and uh, Indonesia's as well, and and so the objective being okay, don't just build a whole bunch of new coal plants. Um, let's try and, and find a way for you to fi finance renewable energy pro projects that will get you to your energy goals without you know, adding a lot of CO2 to the planet. So that's just a, an example, and, and Canada's been uh, feeding in on those and contributing financing to those uh, as well. And they, they keep going. I'm trying to think. I just saw one the other day where they're in the Americas, and I'm for Forgetting which one it is, but anyway, they're 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 rolling them out, and um, I think uh, we're seeing good um, 
good return on investment. And we can export more Canadian LNG. We can also do that. If it displaces coal, we're, we're quite happy with it. That's, um, well, um, I'd like to, what you just mentioned, because um, we had today um, two, our two guests, one from federal government and one from uh, Alberta, which are from politically different like challenging that we have the same in US, Republican and uh, Democrats, they have two different visions for the country's energy and national security. But it was fascinating for me to see how you're collaborating, but also trying to bring up and raise the issues and uh, concern that uh, major oil and gas producers have about the future of their jobs but, or uh, their view of, um, if you call it energy transition, transformation, or energy addition, we still need uh, fossil fuel. And uh, in, uh, on Africa, uh, James, I kind of complimented uh, Craig on how these countries have natural resources, including fossil fuel, and uh, having uh, some of the uh, expertise and experience of Canadian companies or US companies for producing these resources in a more clean uh, manner is important. Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, being so generous with your time. Uh, coming uh, to our uh, school and uh, class, and uh, we opened it to public. Thank you so much for everybody who attended. Please uh, join me to thank uh